Right. One important thing that we have to understand about this chapter is something known as monohybrid inheritance. If you have done monohybrid inheritance in your O levels, uh, then you can skip this video because if you understand how it works, it's fine. But if you need a refresher on monohybrid inheritance, um, you know, I would suggest that you watch this particular video first uh, before moving on to dihybrid inheritance. Now, monohybrid inheritance by definition just means the inheritance of one gene. As an example, we will just take the gene that affects the body color. Now, in the previous video, I told you that genes can have different versions known as alleles. In my example here, the gene for body color has two different versions or two different alleles, and the alleles are as follow, where capital B allele, which is the dominant allele, will make the organism become blue, and the small b allele, will, which is the recessive allele, will make the organism become red. We will represent the dominant allele with a large alphabet, and the recessive allele with a small alphabet, or a lowercase alphabet. Now, as an example here, uh, we have a male parent, and the male parent has the homologous chromosomes, as you can see over there. The lines represent the gene for body color, and in this case, each of the allele is large B, large B. So the genotype of this organism is obviously uh, large B, large B, uh, which is homozygous dominant. And obviously the phenotype of this organism, the observable characteristic is blue because that's the allele that it contains in its uh, chromosomes. Now, when it's going to reproduce, the male parent has to produce gametes, okay? So the process of producing gametes is known as meiosis, right? So as you can see here, I'm just drawing out the diploid cell with two sets of chromosomes at the top over there. Remember, before meiosis, the DNA will undergo replication and therefore it will become the sister chromatids. And I'm showing you that the hi that highlighted chromosome becomes that sister chromatid and that highlighted chromosome becomes that sister chromatid like right that. So far, so good. Now, what's supposed to happen during meiosis 1? During meiosis 1 and cytokinesis, what happens? The purpose of meiosis 1 is to separate the homologous chromosomes. And after cytokinesis, the cells will divide. And as you can see here, the homologous chromosomes have separated. That's fine. Then after that, it is followed by meiosis 2. And during meiosis 2, the sister chromatids will separate. What does it mean by the sister chromatids separate? I'm just drawing a red line to show you how the sister chromatids will break apart, as you can see there, and then it will produce, and after cytokinesis, it will produce four cells, and each cell will have one set of chromosomes, or obviously, in this case, just one chromosome, like that. So, no matter how many gametes it produces, all the cells over here at the bottom each of the cell will only have one chromosome because the original cell had two chromosomes. Meiosis halves the number, so it becomes one, two, two, one. And each of the chromosome will just contain the capital B allele. What this means is, for this male parent over here, no matter how many gametes it produces, 100% of the gametes will only contain large B, one large B. That's basically what it is. And that's why I just drew it at the gamut as one large B over that, all right? Because the male parent will only produce gametes which contain one large B. That's about it. Now, for the homozygous recessive organism over here, it is small b, small b. And obviously the phenotype is red. And in this case, very simple, when it produces gametes, I'm just going to do it again. You have the two chromosomes, the homologous pair over there. It undergoes DNA replication. And then, of course, it undergoes meiosis, which produces, uh, which separates the homologous chromosomes. And then it undergoes meiosis 2 to separate the sister chromatids. And no matter what, all the cells will just contain one small b allele. And for the female parent, which is red, the gamete will only contain one small b. That's it. Now, when the two gametes fertilize or fuse with each other, they will then be able to give you an offspring with the genotype of large b, small b. 
right? No matter what. As long as those gametes fuse with each other, so that means if this male parent and this female parent will reproduce, all their offsprings will always be large B, small B, and the phenotype of the offspring, obviously, because there is one large B and one small B, we know that the dominant allele is expressed over the recessive allele, so the offspring will be blue in color. So 100% of the offsprings that are produced will be blue, no matter what. This is the first part of monohybrid inheritance, so I hope you understand that. So as long as this male parent with a large B, large B genotype and a female parent with a small B, small B genotype reproduce with each other, the male parent will produce a large B gamete and the female parent will only produce a small B gamete and the offspring will always be large B, small B, which will be blue no matter what. Now, let's try it again. Let's say both parents are heterozygous. What does it mean by heterozygous? Heterozygous means both their alleles are different. So in this case over here, the genotype of the male parent is large B, small B. As you can see there, two different alleles. And the female parent is also large B, small B as well. And of course, both of them are blue in color because the large B allele is dominant. When they produce gametes, how many types of gametes can each of them produce? Okay, now let's draw this one out as well. So as you can see here, we have the homologous chromosome over there where it's large B and also a small B. Remember, before meiosis, it undergoes DNA replication and what happens then is they will have those two chromosomes over there. And of course, I'm just putting in the alleles as a reminder for you. And meiosis 1 is to separate the homologous chromosomes they move to their separate cells after cytokinesis. Meiosis II separates the sister chromatids. Now, interestingly, over here, if you notice, some of the cells will carry large B alleles only, and some of the cells will carry small B allele. What's the proportion? The proportion here is 50% of the gametes will be large B, and 50% of the gametes will have small B. So to simplify this, how do we write this? We just put two arrows over that, where... For that male parent, 50% of its gametes is large B, 50% is small B. Some students will ask me, don't I have to write it four times? No, you don't, because it's a proportion, okay? It just tells you that for this male parent over here, 50% of the gametes will have one large B, and 50% of the gametes will have one small B. That's basically it. And for the female parent, it is also exactly the same. Now, how do we fuse the gametes? Now, some students get very confused here, so I'm going to draw a line to separate the gametes, not to confuse you. And I'm going to put MM, which means male gamete, male gamete, and FF, which is female gamete, female gamete. You don't have to put that in the exam. But remember, male gametes can only fuse with female gametes, right? Okay, so male gametes cannot fuse with male gametes. So in this case over here, this male gamete will have a chance of fusing with that female gamete, and the offspring may have a large B, large B. But that same male gamete might have a chance of fusing with the other female gamete. So it's a possibility. It can either fuse with the large B female gamete, or it can fuse with the small B female gamete in this case. So in this situation over here, it might get large B, small B. Now, that other male gamete, which is small b, might have a possibility of fusing with that female gamete, large b, to give you a genotype of the offspring of large b, small b. Now, some students will say, teacher, do I write it as small b, large b, or do I write it as large b, small b? Always put the dominant allele first before the recessive allele, no matter what, okay? But there is also a possibility that the male gamete might fuse with that female gamete to produce a small b, small b genotype. So in this case, what's the phenotype of the offsprings then? It will be blue, blue, blue. But the last one, because there's no dominant alleles and only recessive alleles are present, it will be red. There you go. And the ratio of the offsprings in this case will be 75% chance of getting a blue offspring and 25% chance of getting a red offspring, which is a ratio of 3 blue to 1 red. Remember, genetics is a game of possibility. Does it always mean that if they have 4 offsprings, 3 will be red and 1 will be blue? Not exactly. What it means is it's a possibility. There's a 75% chance of getting a blue offspring and a 25% chance of getting a red offspring. That's what it means in this case. Right here. So, 
Sometimes in the exam, they may ask you to construct a Punnett square. A Punnett square is just basically a cleaner way of doing the crossing of the gametes. For example, in this case, I'm drawing, I'm highlighting the male gametes as green in color. For you don't have to do that in the exam, and I'm highlighting the female gametes as orange in color. Now, what I'm doing is I'm constructing a table, as you can see here. And what you just have to do is you just have to cross them together. Okay, so in this case, that large B gamut and that large B gamut will give offspring of large B large B. The second one is large B small B over there large b small b quite simple it's a cleaner way of doing it it's a simpler way of doing it small b small b so in this situation over here then put the phenotype in immediately yeah by the way so put the genotype and phenotype together and you'll still get the same results three blue to one red okay as a ratio in the exam please don't throw out the phenotype you're not expected to just write it out as blue 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 and red now some students will ask me then in the exam which method do i use do i use the cross method or do i use the pundit square if the question does not specify anything during monohybrid inheritance you are free to do either method but if the question asks you deliberately to if the question deliberately asks you to construct a punnett square please you know construct a punnett square you do need to know how to do a punnett square because it will be more important when we are talking about dihybrid inheritance so that's another one <clears throat> now let's take another situation right here a gene that affects body color in the organism, it has three alleles. And I'm going to put the three alleles as F capital A, F capital B, and small f, where F capital A makes the organism blue, F capital B makes the organism red, and small f makes the organism orange. This is my example. You don't have to memorize my example, by the way. It depends on how the question is given. Now, I'm also going to say that F capital A and F capital B or F A and F B are both codominant, which means to say what does codominance mean? It means that the two alleles can be equally expressed when present and small f in this case is recessive. If an organism's genotype is F A F B, it will have a purple color. I'm setting the rules for my question over here. I'm going to give my example here where this organism the phenotype of the organism is red and blue. That's I'm, I'm based on my question. And I'm also going to say that both parents are heterozygous. Now, because both parents are heterozygous over here, we know that because it's red, it has one FB. And because it's blue, it has one FA. Now, and because it's heterozygous, the only other possibility is it has to be small f in this case. Some students will ask me, teacher, what if, what if it's FBFA? It can't be FBFA because then it makes the organism become purple in color. So it has to be FBF, small f. All right. And for the blue one, it's FA, small f. So again, based on just what we look at it over here, we can keep things very simple. We know that the chromosomes are separated equally, all right, based on what we saw earlier. So 50% of the gametes will be F capital B and 50% of the gametes will be small f for the first parent. And for the second parent, 50% of the gametes will be F capital A and 50% of the gametes will be small f. Construct a Punnett square. I'm just deciding to do a Punnett square because it's easier. And we just write out the gametes over there. And then what do we do? We cross them together. And when we cross them, the first one, F, A, F, B, that organism is purple. The second column on the right, the second one on the right, F, A, small f, blue. The one at, at the bottom, F, B, small f, red. Small f, small f will make it become orange in color. There we go. So in this case, you will get a very interesting ratio of one purple to one blue to one red and to one orange. That's essentially how monohybrid inheritance works. And I'm just throwing in codominance to give you an idea of how it can happen as well. So this is just a pretty simple, um, what do you call this, uh, overview of how monohybrid inheritance is going to happen. Does monohybrid, do they ask questions about monohybrid inheritance in the exam, especially for paper four, Cambridge A-levels? 
these days they rarely do, but there is a possibility it might come up. So I'm just talking about it. 